Can we go in our Bibles to the book of Daniel, the third chapter? Daniel chapter 3. And I'm going to read verse 1 and 2. Here begins the reading of God's word. The book of Daniel, the, th the third chapter. Verse 1 from the New American Standard Version of the Scriptures. Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold the height of which was 60 cubits and the width six cubits. He set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon or Iraq. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king sent word to assemble the satraps, the prefects and the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates, and all the rulers of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Verse 13. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in rage and anger, gave order to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Then these men were brought before the king. Nebuchadnezzar responded to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the golden image that I have set up? Now if you are ready at the moment, you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the lyre, the trigon, the psaltery, and the bagpipe, and all kinds of music to fall down and to worship the image that I have made very well. But if you do not worship, you will be immediately cast into the fire of the furnace, of the furnace of blazing fire. And what God is there who can deliver you out of my hands. Shadrach, Meshach, Ahmed, Abednego replied to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to give you an answer concerning this matter. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the furnace of blazing fire, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But even if he does not, let it be known to you, O king, that we are not going to serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar was filled with wrath, and his facial expression was altered towards Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And he answered by giving orders to heat the furnace seven times more than it was usually heated. He commanded certain valiant warriors who were in his army to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in order to cast them into the furnace of blazing fire. Then these men were tied up in their trousers, their coats, their caps, and their other clothes and were cast into the midst of the furnace of blazing fire. For this reason, because the king's command was urgent and the furnace had been made extremely hot, the flame of the flask slew those men who carried up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell in the midst of the blazing fire, still tied up. Then Nebuchadnezzar, the king, was astounded and stood up in haste. He said to his high officials, was it not three men we cast into the midst of the fire? They replied to the king, certainly, O king. He said, look, I see four men, loose and walking about in the midst of the fire without harm. And the appearance of the fourth is like the son of the gods. Then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the door of the burning of the furnace of blazing fire. 
He responded and said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, come out, you servants of the Most High God, and come here. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the midst of the fire. The satraps, the prefects, the governors, and the king's high officials gathered around and saw in regard to these men that the fire had no effect on the bodies of these men, nor was their, the hair of their heads singed, nor were their trousers damaged, nor had the smell of the fire even come upon them. And Nebuchadnezzar responded and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants, who put their trust in him, violating the king's command and yielded up their bodies so as not to serve or worship any god except their own. Therefore, I make a decree that any people, nation or tongue, that speaks anything offensive against the god of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be torn limb from limb and their houses reduced to a rubbish heap inasmuch as there is no other God who is able to deliver this way. Then the king caused Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to, be prosper, to prosper or to be promoted in the province of Babylon. Heavenly Father, we thank you. Give voice to your word this evening. We pray, come, kingdom of God, come in fuller dimension and measure, will of God be done in our lives, through our lives, for our lives. Be glorified. Let there be divine interruption. We give you all the praise and all the glory. Somebody agrees with me by saying amen. I believe that we are in the last stages of the formation of God's army. Not everybody, not every church is on Mount Zion. And not everybody that goes to church is going to be part of the body of Christ. Um, God is forming a body. And those are people who have, been, have gone through hell and high water to make the, the cut. Um, this army is going to be an army of disciplined people who know how to war. People who are obedient to God, and so on and so forth. But this, 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 this evening, uh, I'd like to talk to you for a few moments out of the, the book of Daniel. Daniel um, is a prophetic book and has a lot of eschatological innuendos. And um, we would do well to observe some of the things that Daniel is talking about because they're, uh, they're, they're scenarios that are going to be played out in these end times. And the first thing that we note is that Nebuchadnezzar, who is a type of a world ruler, um, who ruled over the empire of Babylon, and Babylon um, comprised of 120 provinces, and if you like, 120 nations. So uh, Nebuchadnezzar was a ruler over a world, uh, an empire that dominated the world in his time, which comprised of 120 nations. And, and can I just say it as it is? Can I say it as it is? Touch your name and say, you may get hurt. And, and, and um, so he builds and erects this statue, and this statue is 60, 60 cubits, and six cubits high. And he has six types of musical equipment, six names of rulers, uh, six types of musical equipment, the, the flute, the lyre, the trigon, psaltery, the bag type, bagpipe, and other kinds of worship. Uh, or the other kinds of music, and he wants everybody to fall down and to worship this image that he has erected. He's dedicating this image, and he brings uh, satraps and prefects and governors, counselors, treasurers, judges, and magistrates, and all kinds of rulers to the de dedication of this image. Now, everything would have been fine, except that um, we understand that there is a new world order that is forming. And this new world order comprises of a one world religion, a one world financial system, and a one world religious system, a one world government. 
which will be headed by the Antichrist. Now, when we look at this statue, we understand that it has Satan's imprint all over it. Um, understand that nu uh, numerologically, uh, uh, 60 is, 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 is the number of um, idolatry and 66 is the number of pride and uh, idolatrous worship and, and uh, uh, six is the number of man or if you like the number of carnality, the number of the flesh and 600 is the number of warfare and 666 is the number of the beast according to the Revelations chapter 13 and so on and so forth. And so we see that this is um, a whole prefiguration of a satanic kingdom that is forming. Uh, another place where we see this kind of thing is in Goliath. Goliath is 60 cubits and a span, and his weaver's beam is six. So we have 666, the imprint of 666 all over this. And according to Revelation chapter 13, one of the things that the enemy is going to do uh, through the system called the beast or the satanic trinity, which comprises of Satan, the false prophet, and, uh, and the beast, is to set up a system um, that the Bible describes as 666, by which or, without you receiving that mark, either in your forehead or in your hand, none will be able to buy or sell in the marketplace. So he's, it's going to be a system where we will all be registered and we cannot do one transaction unless you are part of that system. So you can't even go to a 7-Eleven and buy a Coke without being part of that system. No one, the Bible says, will be able to buy or sell in the marketplace. Understand that Peter begins to prophesy in the books of Timothy um, that in the last days there shall come perilous times and that many shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. So the first thing we need to note is that times are not going to get easier circumstantially. They're going to get worse. The Bible says in the last days the mystery of iniquity shall increase. The mystery of lawlessness shall increase. So circumstantially around us, things are not going to improve because uh, Satan is going to continue to, 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 to promote his agendas in the earth and is going to take much more grace to stand with God. But the Bible does say where iniquity does abound, grace does not much more abound. So as much as the enemy is doing, touch your neighbor and say, God is doing much more. But it therefore means that we're going to have to be so focused that we will not allow circumstances, situations, nor events to distract us. Touch your neighbor and say, do not let what you attract distract you. So no matter what's happening around you, you cannot allow yourself to be distracted. Touch three people and say, you've got to focus. So he says there are going to be perilous times and there's going to be an apostasy in the last days. And we're seeing it's, he's making it much more harder to, to worship God. And Jesus is looking for people who can really worship him in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such. And he's making it, they're noise bands. We can't, we can't make too much noise any longer. And if your church is not soundproofed, then you are in trouble. They're going to shut you down. There are certain things, for instance, in Europe, we cannot say in churches that may sound a little bit offensive to some people who have decided to uh, uh, have same-sex relationships. Are you listening to me? And in some churches in Europe, if you preach against it, they're going to try and close your church down. And, and if they come and tell you that they want you to marry them, you're going to have to find a very good excuse to say no. 
and they can say that they can, they can file charges against you. So the enemy is making it very, very hard to really worship God. They're, in the last days, they're going to come against the church. If the Antichrist is going to set up his system, then he is going to try and do everything he can Antichrist. Are you listening to me? And, and you cannot allow yourself to be sidetracked. You can't allow yourself to be sucked into his system. And because the enemy is so subtle, he can draw you in. The Bible says, in the last days, many shall depart from the faith, being seduced by what? By see, seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Seduction is very subtle. It just doesn't happen abruptly. Are you with me? Because what the enemy is really after is your worship. Touch your neighbor and say, don't let the devil steal your worship. Uh, can I go a little bit deeper here? Uh, God. And so here is this big image that has Satan's imprint all over it. And Nebuchadnezzar calls all the nations to gather around and the rulers of those nations. And when you look at all the different rulers that he calls, people, uh, lawmakers were there. Uh, administrators were there and, and, uh, and all arms of government were represented from the executive to the legislative to the judiciary and they all have to bow down to this image. But something happens with three children of God, uh, Shidrach, Meshach, and Abednego, friends of Daniel. Now, to understand how these three guys or four guys think, uh, uh, they were brought up in, in, in the midst of a revival that was going for, going, uh, uh, that was breaking out in the, in, in the, in the reign of Josiah. Josiah was one of the, the, the great reformers in Old Testament times, together with people like Nehemiah, with, together with people like Hezekiah, and so on and so forth. And, 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 and revival in those days was not about having a goosebump experience uh, with the sound of music. It was about studying and bringing, uh, restoring the word of God back into God's house. We've come in a day and an age where nobody likes to read their Bibles anymore. And you think that you're going to grow uh, by your coming to uh, sit down and have a, an ecstatic experience of singing songs. And we call that worship. And touch your neighbor and say, that's far from worship. Uh, I, 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 are you with me? The revival in the time of Ezra, they stood up on their feet for six hours reading the scriptures. And that's what the Bible called revival. Uh, 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 many of us, how many of you are so hungry for God? Uh, yes, but you see, you cannot have, you can have no more of God than you have of his word. The degree to which you know the word is the degree to which you have God in you. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. So the more of the word that is living in you, the more of God is indwelling in you. You cannot have God without his word. No longer can no also you can can you no neither also can you have the word without God. Are you with me? So we need a revival. And what the revival is, let's touch three people and say, let's get back into God's word. We we, we come to church and we impose time limits on ourselves. But in the days of Ezra's revival, they were reading the, the scriptures in one place for six hours. And the Bible called that a revival. And every time you see a revival in the Old Testament, it started with the tithes and the offerings. So the, the, the worship system could be restored and erected because if there was no tithe, there would be no priest. Are you with me? Can I go a little bit deeper here? And there's Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego that were brought up in this revival, so, so they were brought up with the word of God right from the time they were born. As soon as they could read or write, they were taught the word of God. They were taught to, 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 to memorize the Torah. So the word of God was living in them. So when they were taken in the captivity to Babylon, they still were holding on to the first things that they were taught. Unlike us who had a secular education before a biblical education. 
And when you have a secular education before a biblical education, then the operating system that is imprinted in your mind is that of the secular. And many of us are now trying to get a biblical operating system running. But it's not running because you touch your neighbor and say you have not gotten rid of that secular operating system that you were programmed with when you went to school when you were four years old. Are you with me? And so there's a dynamic tension. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego uh, uh, are told to bow down to this image at the dedication. And they refuse to bow down in direct obedience to the commandment of the word of God. Where God says that he's a jealous God and you shall not make the representation of anything of the likeness in heaven or on earth and blah, 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 blah. And so it's against explicitly stated that they're not, God said, you're not to bow down and worship any idol. And so while the whole world is bowing down. To this idol because of the intimidation of a man called Nebuchadnezzar who was a fearsome ruler. Uh, they refused to bow. And so an accusation was brought against them. The only place where the enemy could find an accusation was in the place of their prayer and their worship. Daniel was a man of excellence that they could not find even anything against him except the, the only thing they could bring up about against him was that this Daniel is praying three times a day. And they're not going to worship any religious system. So they're not going to bow down and become part of a religious system. So the enemy brought accusation against them in the area of their faith, in their area of the worship. Nebuchadnezzar says to these three young men that if you do not bow down to my image, you are in direct contravention to my decrees and my constitution. And so I'm going to heat the fire seven times hotter and I'm going to throw you into that fire. And the three Hebrew children uh, Looking at Nebuchadnezzar, begin to answer him and tell them, ne Nebuchadnezzar, we know that you are, you are a king and that you're the most fearsome ruler in this world system at this moment in time. Nevertheless, in spite of who you are and all the greatness of your power and all your might and the gods that you service, uh, the gods that you serve, we have our own God, who is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He is the God that created the whole earth, and the earth is his, and the fullness thereof, and everything that dwells therein. Even the gold that you use to build your statue belongs to him. And so if there are other gods, then this God is a God above every other God. He's called the Alpha and the Omega. He's called the Ancient of Days. He's called the Lion of the tribe of Judah. So Nebuchadnezzar, even though you are king, there is another God who is called the King of Kings. So if there's anybody that we're going to obey, and if there's anybody we have to fear, rather than fear you, we will fear the one that created you, who is called the King of Kings. So we're not going to bow down. And it doesn't matter how bad the situation is. So even if you heat it seven times hotter, which is seven is the number of perfection uh, and completion. So you can do all you like, Nebuchadnezzar. But we will not be intimidated by our circumstances. So if you like, we are, you can throw us into the fire. And even if you throw us into the fire, our God, who is the God of all flesh, is able to deliver us. And just in case God does not deliver us, we are still not going to bow. Can you touch three people and say, we are not going to bow to our circumstances? We are not going to bow to the religious systems of this world. We're not going to bow to constitutions that are ungodly and that are secular without God. Touch three people and say, we're not going to bow any longer. 
one of the problems of this age is that there is a spirit of compromise that has come upon us and is trying to steal your generation. And I'm here as a guardian to what God wants to do with your generation to protect your generation from the spirit of compromise. Compromise is settling for less than God has given you. And one of the things that I have found out is what you compromise to get, you are going to lose anyway and you're going to have to compromise to keep. Uh, are you with me? Can I go a little bit deeper? So Satan is trying to use events and situations you know, to, 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 to trigger circumstances that will dominate your mind with fear and thus intimidate you and cripple your faith to stop you from getting what God has for you. Are you with me? So he will use situation to create fear. And when fear is internalized inside you, it creates a phobia. And when a phobia is inside you, it cripples your faith. Satan is not trying to kill your body because uh, uh, he's trying to kill your faith. When he can kill your faith, he has cut you off from God. When he can kill your faith, he has cut you off from receiving from God or doing anything with God and for God. Because without faith, it is impossible to please him. Are uh, you listening? to me. Touch three people again and tell them Satan is not after your life, he's after your faith. When he's got your faith, he's got your life. And how does he use? He uses circumstances and situations to cause you to bow down to those circumstances and submit yourself to them. And there's somewhere in the Bible, I believe it is Romans 6, 16, where the Bible says, to whomsoever you yield yourself, a servant to obey, you become the servant or that thing has mastered you. So whatever you serve, whatever you obey, whatever you bow down becomes your master. You become a slave to that thing. You become a slave to that person and so on and so forth. So it is to the enemy's advantage to begin to create marital problems in your home, to create problems on your job, to take the money out of your pocket so you don't have any money to fix your car and to fix your leaking roof so that you can bow down to the circumstances of the times. Touch somebody and says, I'm not going to bow. So these three, these three Hebrew children decided that we are not going to bow. They were not going to allow the enemy to interfere with their faith in God. They were not going to worship a false religious system. They were not going to enter into false worship. They refused to compromise. We have come into a season in this earth, in our nations, where the enemy is always trying to come get us to compromise our values. The story of compromise in the Bible is a sad one. Adam compromised and he followed his wife's sin and he lost paradise. Uh, Abraham compromised the truth. Uh, he lied about his wife to another man two times and he lost, we, we, we brought the whole world into conflict. The reason why there's conflict in the Middle East today was because of Ishmael, the child of the flesh. Touch your neighbor and say, I will not let the flesh have dominion over me. Uh, uh, are you with me? Uh, the Ishmaelites, God gave a prophecy about the Ishmaelites that their hand will be against their brothers and so on and so forth. And that's the reason why we're facing Boko Haram in Nigeria and so on and so forth. Because Abraham compromised in his value system and he lied about his wife to an Egyptian king, and so on and so forth. Uh, 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 and Sarah told him to go out uh, 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 and to have a child uh, uh, from another woman, and Ishmael was the son of another mother, and the rest is history. Touch your neighbor and say, study your history. So Sarah herself compromised by advising Abraham to go into Hagar. Esau compromised. He sold his birthright for a moment of instant, a moment of gratification, for instantaneous pleasure. He sold it the things of eternal consequence for tangible material things. Of which God said, stomach for the food for the stomach, stomach for the food, and what? All shall perish. He valued the material connection to this world more than the eternal things of, uh, the, the things of eternal consequence. And he sold his birthright. He compromised. He lost it all. Uh, Aaron compromised his convictions on idolatry. 
and, and worship. And whilst Moses was on the mountain getting ten, ten commandments or wedding vows to betroth Israel to himself, uh, Aaron builds a golden calf and gets the whole of Israel to, that were down there to consent and worship this golden calf. And not only that, Aaron was a huge liar. He said, the people gave me their gold. I just threw the gold into the fire and out jumped a golden calf. He compromised his values. He compromised in the area of idolatry and he ended up building a golden calf and a whole worship system and engaged Israel into that worship system. And because of that, I believe, Aaron was locked out of the promised land. His compromise locked him out of the promises of God for his life. He never entered into the promised land. Touch three people and say, break the power of the spirit of compromise upon your life. Samson compromised his moral and righteous devotion uh, of the Nazarite vow. And not only did Delilah kill, take his strength away from him, he lost his vision uh, and, and he ended up losing his life. David compromised his convictions about moral and divine strength. He committed murder by having uh, Uriah, was it Uriah? Uh, Uriah killed and, 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 and at the end of the day, he lost his son. And I believe that one of the reasons why David could not build the temple, which was his greatest and foremost desire in his heart, because his hands were stained with innocent blood. Are you with me? Because he compromised for another woman, another man's wife. Uh, Solomon, oh God, help me. Solomon compromised. First Kings chapter 10 uh, tells us that Solomon uh, had a, a, a re his annual revenue was 666 talents of gold a year. Now, the thing about 666 is that the Bible mentions that the, the mark of the beast is 666, which he tries to sell to everybody to take that mark so that they can worship his, him through his system, which means that Solomon entered into a revenue system of 666. Not only that, the steps to his throne were six. Are you with me? The whole world came to see Solomon in all his glory. And his, his palace was probably bigger than the temple he built or more magnificent. The Bible doesn't record that they came to see the temple. The Bible says that they came to visit him and he was showing off his house. And the redemptive purpose of all that glory and magnificence was so that all the nations could understand there is a God of glory, Elohim, yeah. Yahweh, Jehovah, that is the God of Israel. And it doesn't record that the people that came to visit him went about saved. Yes, they acknowledged God, just like Nebuchadnezzar acknowledged God in the fire. Nebuchadnezzar recognized who God was but he was not going to serve God. He said, I see a fourth man in the fire who looks like the son of God. So they knew about the son of God, but they decided they weren't going to worship the son of God. Are you with me? Solomon married 1,000 wives. He backslid. The man that God had endowed with a lot of wisdom. And one of the things, the warnings to us out of that in this generation is that we may start something beautifully in the, we may start something in the spirit and it may end up in the flesh if, we don't, if we're not careful. So things always start, but somehow the enemy always brings a perversion or a corruption into them. And so we start from the spirit. And Paul said, you guys started, oh foolish Galatians. Who has bewitched you? You started well in the spirit. Now you've ended up beautifully in the flesh. Ahab married Jezebel and he lost his throne. Ananas and Sapphira compromised on the area of money. And because of whatever, and they, they died. So the story of compromise in the Bible is about settling for less than God has actually given you in his plan. Touch your neighbor and say, don't settle for less 
than God has given you. Because compromise will always cost you something in the end. If you compromise now, then you are sabotaging your future for a present need. So touch your neighbor and say, don't sabotage your future for a present need, for momentary gratification. Anytime you compromise, you are putting your future on hold. Uh, we compromise because we're trying to meet our own needs instead of trusting God to meet them in his own way and in his own timing. So we are a microwave generation. We want everything fast. We're always looking for shortcuts to get into the promised land. And I have good news for you. Touch your neighbor and say, there are no shortcuts. It's a straight and a narrow road. And few there are that go that way. But broad is the road to destruction. So touch your neighbor and say, just wait it out. Are you, with, are, you, are you with me? Can I go a little bit deeper? Joseph was a man who, was, who did not compromise. Even though he could have had beautiful Potiphera, I call her, Potiphar's wife. And, and he could have had the trappings of Egypt, uh, the finest of Egypt. It would not have lasted forever. One day, Potiphar would have found out that there was a relationship between Joseph and his wife. And the day that Potiphar finds out, he's not just going to lock Joseph in jail, he's going to behead him. Are you listening to me? Thank God. Joseph refused to compromise, and he decided to go to prison because of his refusal to compromise. Touch your name and say, will you go to prison because you refuse to compromise? Touch somebody else and say, you've got to draw the line where God draws the line. If you're going to be a generation that God is going to reckon with, then touch your name and say, you've got to break the spirit of compromise off your life. Draw the line where God draws the line. You cannot compromise in the area of our values anymore. Our children are killing themselves in schools, shooting themselves because they're angry, because they are amoral. They don't have the fear of God in their hearts anymore because they lost it somewhere along the line. Touch someone and say, draw the line where God draws the line. Are you listening to me? And where God says no, you've got to say no, not maybe. Maybe is an abstention. And God hates neutral parties. There's no neutrality in the kingdom of God. You're either hot or you are cold. You're either building with God or you're scattering. You're either with Christ or you are against Christ. There's no neutral ground. Touch your neighbor and say, God is a God of absolutes. Where do you stand? Are you with me? We can't afford to compromise anymore. Don't bend the rules. Uh, uh, the, the age says, let's bend a few rules. Touch them and say, bending the rules is breaking the rules. There's no white lie and there's no black lie. A lie is a lie. There is no white witchcraft and there is no black witchcraft. It's all what? Witchcraft. Touch your neighbor and say, reduce things to their lowest common denominator. We're living in a, a, a permissive society that is trying to get us to bend the rules. And we call it secular humanism. That everything is relative. That everybody has a right to know God for themselves. Their own God. And they're teaching us that we need to tolerate somebody else. So tolerate some man walking in, in a skirt into church. And we're supposed to tolerate it. So what you are saying is that God made a mistake by making you male when you are supposed to be female. So you have automatically told your God he doesn't know what he's doing. And touch your neighbor and say, you're going to tolerate that crap? Are you listening to me? And if it is, if God tolerates it, then why can't two men have children together? Are you listening to me? And if they do get married, then one man automatically plays the roles, roles of what? A woman, while the other man plays the roles of a man. So one is dominating the other as, as a woman and a male. So touch on them and say they still believe in marriage. And they still believe in opposite sex. Because the one man in the, the partnership plays 
the woman. Touch on them and say, you've got to think. And the world says we should accept it. God himself did not accept it. He caused fire to fall on Sodom and Gomorrah. And the problem with the church today is we lack the ability to call fire down. Because we have compromised in everything else. And so we have lost the presence of God. And we get some little itchy bitchy goosebump experience and we say God is here. My friend, God is not here. If God is here, why aren't you changing your spheres of influence? When you walk into your office on Monday morning, they should feel the anointing. Look, what did Laban say to, to Jacob? I, I can see that the presence of God is on you. And whatever it, that thing is, is on you, is causing me to prosper. Touch your neighbor and say, what is the anointing accomplishing in your office? What's it accomplishing in your home? What's it accomplishing in your job? And you say you're anointed. The level of anointing we need this day is to call fire down. And you sing that song, the days of Elijah. If we're in the days of Elijah, touch your neighbor and say, where's your fire? Touch your neighbor and say, if you don't stand for something, you fall for everything. And I'm tired. If you, I, I don't know about you, but I'm tired of falling. So I've decided that when I have no, I've done everything I know how to stand, I'm standing. And I'm drawing the line. And I'm saying, enough is enough. Lift up your voice and shout, enough is enough. I've had enough. Are you listening to me? There are things that cannot be controversial. They're called non-negotiables. We cannot compromise any longer our faith in God. We cannot compromise any longer the values that God has established. Let God be true and every man a liar. Are you listening to me? The society is telling us we need to become more tolerant. Tolerant of what? The devil? Touch your name and say, no siree. It's not going to happen. I've seen what tolerance can do. I live in a region that where they're bombing churches. And I'm asking God questions. Why can some Ishmaelites come in and bomb our churches and kill Christians? Where is God? Where is the God of Elijah? Because my Bible tells me when the enemy comes in as a flood, the Spirit of the Lord is supposed to raise a standard. So if there wasn't a standard uh, uh, raised to restrain the enemy and restrain those bombs from going off, is it possible that maybe God is not even there in the first place? And we're just practicing some false worship system called goosebumps. And there's no real presence there because things are not changing. A nation that prays like we do. I don't think there's any nation that prays like Nigerians pray. On every street, there are 10 churches. There's a multitude of churches and people praying. Nobody has all nights like Nigerians do. Yet the nation is still corrupt. And things circumstantially don't seem to be getting better. Yet the effect of fervent prayer of the righteous man is supposed to avail much. There's supposed to be some tangible transformation. That's what God said, be ye not conformed to the patterns of this. And that world over there is ion, which means the times. Which means do not fashion yourself according to the patterns of the times. What is it to fashion yourself? So that means that somebody out there is dictating a pattern. Some designer calls a label and draws a pattern. And that pattern may mean that when you cut the dress, it's going to expose most of your upper half. And when you cut the dress, it's going to be so short that when you come to church, you're going to have to use a scarf to cover your legs. And then we, the church that are supposed to be dictating the pattern, are conforming to their pattern. Are you listening to me? 
and then somebody invents a name of some kind of fashion and he calls it bling bling. And then you decide that you're going to bling bling. And you come to church in all your bling bling. And the difference is that their bling bling is real and your bling bling is counterfeit. Yet you have conformed yourself to somebody else's pattern. Oprah Winfrey is dictating, and she makes no secret that she's new age. She's dictating what you wear. She's dictating what you think. You, it's supposed to be the other way around. You are supposed to be saying, this is the pattern. Now you follow it. So instead of we conforming the world to God's pattern, the world is coming from forming us to their patterns. Can I go a little bit deeper here? And one of the patterns is sound. The heaven works with sound. When God created the earth, he made a sound. He said, sound, let there be. The walls of Jericho, they made a sound in one accord. Boom, and the walls, the, the walls crumbled. On the day of Pentecost, there was a sound. And here, in a book about the end times, here is Nebuchadnezzar, a type of a satanic ruler, creating sound with all kinds of instruments. How many? Six. The number of man. Six. The number of the flesh. Six. The number of carnality. And he's trying to get all of us to listen to the sound. And once we listen to the sound, the sound begins to affect us that we bow down in worship. And because the Bible says, do not be conformed to the pattern. Do not be fashioned with the pattern of this world. We go out there. We listen to their sound. Then we come into church on Sunday. And we just change the lyrics of the song. And put some, in quotes, Christian lyrics. But the inspiration of the sound was never from God. Because if the root is not holy, then the branches ain't going to be holy. And so we now sing the songs and we out there in the pews are dancing to the songs. And dancing is a form of worship. Touch your neighbor and say, be careful the kind of sound you allow into your spirit. Are you listening to me? And we think, uh, and this is the whole deception, and we think because we're making a sound that people, the world can identify with, we are being successful. And so you are creating an image for yourself. Nebuchadnezzar caused them to fall down and bow down to his image. So the enemy is trying to bring us to a place where we create an image, we brand ourselves. Are you listening to me? To create your own self-image. And the reason why we're trying to create our own self-image is because you have lost the image of God. And nature abhors a vacuum. Are you listening to me? Right there in Revelation chapter 13, the Bible says they, he was forced everybody to receive the mark to bow down and worship his word. Image. The Bible that tells us in Genesis chapter 1 that God made, uh, made everything in the likeness of his image. Touch your neighbor and say, the earth devil is after your image. He's trying to change your image to get you to accept an image that was never really from God in the first place. Touch your neighbor and say, who do you think you are? Because your image is who you think you are. So you try to promote who you think you are. Are you listening to me? You may think you're bad self. You're six cubits high, six cubits long, and you think you're bad. And you think because the world is celebrating you, you have an image. Touch your neighbor and say, that's a counterfeit image. That's what the Bible or the dictionary calls a virtual image. A virtual image is a, div uh, a divergence of light that creates a shadow. And you're caught up in a shadow rather than being caught up in the reality of who God said you were. 
And the reason why we try to promote some kind of image for ourselves is because we've lost touch with God. So we are confused. We don't have our identity in Christ. So we have to find some kind of image. Why are you listening to me? Because we've lost ourselves. We don't know who we are anymore. Bow down and worship. So what the enemy is really after is your worship. He touched your name and said, the enemy is after your worship. That's what he did to Jesus. Matthew chapter 4. He said, I will give you. He took Jesus to a high hill and said, I will give you all the domains of this world if you will just bow down and worship. Touch your neighbor and say, the enemy is after your worship. And because Neb, uh, the three Hebrew children refused to worship his image, an image that he was trying to promote. You know what? I was reading on the internet the other day that Beyonce is now going to make an album with Destiny's Child. And they picked a song. I can't remember the Jesus song it was. The, sorry? Jesus say yes. This is a woman who has sold her soul to the devil. Look at her costumes. They have all Satan's marks and tattoos on it. The goat hair and everything. And they're always doing all these signs. Six, this is 666. Six, six. All this. And at a concert. Did I hear my name? At a concert. She and her husband are telling everybody to lift up their hands and do this. And you've, you've just initiated thousands of people at the concert into a satanic system. I'm an African. I understand these things. And you go there and you two, you're doing, and you know what? We come to church and we copy all their dances. <laughs> and we're moving the way they move. Meanwhile, their dances may be a satanic ritual to engage Sasha Fierce. Because in Africa, we understand that when we want to invoke spirits, there's certain... The, the American Indians can teach you that. And you come out here into the house of God. And you are replicating moves that you learn from outside there. And expecting God to... Uh, uh, to endorse them and come and move in your midst. When your worship is not real, it's borrowed worship. Are you listening to me? Many of you don't understand where certain things come from. And, and, and uh, uh, this generation, you've got to save them. We can't keep on wearing our pants down there. And touch your neighbor and say, what's your hairstyle? I'm a Jamaican. I understand where dreadlocks come from. And you think because you look good, you're going to dreadlock yourself? No wonder you're locked up in dread. And you just see all these things. And you copy them. them. Huh? Listen, I'm a reformer. So even if the last time I come here, so be it. I don't care. Touch your name and say, don't compromise any longer. Look what happened after these guys went into the fire. I've told you. Touch your, neighbor and say, touch your neighbor and say, stop trying to run away from the fire. You will miss God. You only find God in the midst of the fire. Count it all joy when you go through fiery tests and trials. Are you listening to me? There's some, the, the, the kingdom is about process. Touch your neighbor and say, you're going to have to go through some stuff. That's what gives you an anointing. When you go through some stuff. When you pass through the water, it's not if you pass, when. So if you pass through sooner, the better off you come. 
But when you delay your passing through, you're delaying your destiny. When you pass through the fire, I will be with you. The fire shall not kindle over you. When you pass through the waters, I, the waters will not overflow you. I will be there. So God is only there in the fiery trials. Touch your name and say, jump into the fire if you want to meet Jesus. And the fire comes when you say, I refuse to bow down to anything that does not come from God. Period. And if God doesn't deliver me, I'm not afraid to die. Because to be absent in the body is to be present with God. Who shall deliver me of the body of this flesh? I can't wait for the redemption of my body. So I've come to a place where I am not afraid to die. If some Muslim fundamentalists are prepared to blow themselves up for the God who they believe in, who is not a God, then I am prepared to lay my life down as a living sacrifice, holy and presentable to God, which is my reasonable service. If you're not ready to die for what you believe in, then you don't even have a testimony. You can't stand as a witness in the courts of heaven. For we only overcome by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony. Because they love not their lives unto death. Because they were ready to die for the values of justice and righteousness in Christ. Only then can you be called an overcomer. Because you've overcome death. Now, you have some weight in heaven. Because heaven knows that whatever there's a need, you're prepared on earth. You're prepared to lay down your life. Are you listening to me? Touch your name and say, who are you worshiping? They went into the fire. Even Nebuchadnezzar knew God, but he refused to worship God. I see four men in the fire and one man like the son of God. So he knew who the son of God was, but he had so much material attachment that his material attachments will not allow him to worship the true God. Because to worship the true God, he was going to have to detach himself from his material attachment. Jesus put it this way. You're either worshiping God or you're worshiping mammon. Touch your neighbor and say, I refuse to be a mammonite. Are you listening to me? Because the whole, this whole thing that we're reading was about who are you going to worship? Are you going to worship the system, or you're going to worship the true God. And these guys, because they refused to compromise, they went into the fire. But the good news is, was that Jesus showed up. Emmanuel, Jehovah Shammah, the ever-present help in times of trouble. Not out of trouble, in times of trouble. So unless you're in trouble, he has no reason to show up. Are you listening to me? And these guys were transformers, which is my prayer for this ge new generation, Global Force, that you become world transformers. We don't want revival without transformation or reformation. The greatest revival on this earth called the Welsh Revival, 100 years later, less than 3% are still in church today. So revivals will petter out, and then we're back to the same old place where we came from. I don't want to go back to where I came from. God has called us to be change agents. We are reformers so that we can be transformers, so that we can bring revival. Touch your neighbor and say, reformation first, then revival. How can you transform your world when you need to be transformed in your mind first? So touch your neighbor and say, work on yourself. Are you listening to me? May I take it a little bit 
deeper. It was all about worship. Satan was trying to get them to worship a counterfeit. And they refused to bow. But because they refused to bow, number one, their enemies were executed. Number two, they were tied up in the fire. Their chains were broken. Number three, Nebuchadnezzar acknowledged God. Number four, the decrees and the constitutions of the nation were changed. I now make a new decree. Anybody who speaks against the God of Shidrach, Meshach, and Abednego, their houses shall be made a dunghill, they shall be destroyed. So the constitution, there was national, a change of national constitution. Because they refused to compromise. Number five or number six, they were promoted. They all got their promotions and they ruled over the land of Babylon because they refused to compromise in their worship. Can I go a little bit deep as I bring this to a close? That word worship actually means from an old English Anglo-Saxon word, we are the ship, which means to attach worth. Are you listening to me? Yes. To attach worth. And to attach worth, therefore, means to ascribe value. Yes? Something is worth something because of its value. And that value comes from how much investment you have in that thing in terms of money, time, or effort. So things take on new value according to how much we have invested of resources into that thing. Are you with me? So the more you value something, the more you ascribe worth to it. And that's what the Bible calls worship. To attach worth. Worship was not singing slow songs. So you can come in here and sing songs out of an idolatrous heart because your motivation is the money you're going to get. And God is a God that seeks your motive. The motivation behind which you do anything. Are you with me? Can I go a little bit deeper here? So we understand that the enemy was trying to steal their worship by getting them to compromise on their values. Because they were now going to ascribe more value to the image than they were to their God. Where you're, because where your treasure is, is where your heart is going to be. So wherever you have an investment, is wherever your heart is going to be attached. Touch your name and say, how much have you invested in the kingdom? And how much have you invested in the world? Ask somebody this question. How much do you value God? Because your value of God will determine the price you are going to pay for God. Because nothing comes without a price. Even Jesus on the cross was a price. The only begotten son of God. And the precious blood of the lamb that you sing about every day. Touch your name and say, how much of the price are you going to pay? Because your walk with God, the price always gets higher and higher. The disciples said, Lord, we have left everything. Not some things. So then your walk with God is determined and your value in God is how much have you let go? How much have you given up for God? His disciples, we have left everything to follow you. Touch your neighbor and say, what have you given up for God? Because that will determine how much value you've placed upon God 
and that will do the, your value will describe how much you worth you ascribe to God and how much worth you ascribe to God is your worship to God Abraham didn't go and worship God with songs he said the child and I shall go yonder and worship what was Abraham's worship the sacrifice of Isaac the sacrifice of things and attachments to show God that he was more attached to him than attached to the material things of this world that the world uses to define success. Big house, nice car, and so on and so forth. And when we see those things and big church, and because you have 50,000 people going to your church, does not mean you're successful. Gideon's church was 22,000 strong and only 300 God was reckoning with. So touch them and say, what are you fashioning yourself to? Are you with me? God is looking for true worshipers. They worship him in spirit and in truth. Who are investing value into the kingdom and they're showing God that we can lay down anything because the price is how much you have let go how much you have given to God that is your true spiritual act of worship ascribing worth to him let me ask you a simple question because I can't go on I gotta stop if you give 49% of what you have to God and keep 51%, who have you attached value to? Who? To who? To yourself. So who are you worshiping? Yourself. If you give 51% to God and keep 49% for yourself, who have you put more value on? So you have ascribed more worth to God? So you worship God more than you worship yourself. So go to three people again and say, who are you worshiping? Because a close relationship to the material world is the key to Satan doing what he wants to do in your life and against you. So God says, if we take money, because money answereth what? In this earth, all things. And serve the kingdom of God with it, it damages Satan's kingdom. That's why when it's time to give, it starts a, a tug of war. Giving always starts a tug of war. You can't serve God and money, mammon. But you can serve God with your money. When you are serving God with your money, you are demonstrating to God that he is your master and not the money. The money, which is the love, the, the love of all evil is, the, the love of money is the root. You touch your neighbor and say, love is about relationship. So ask your neighbor again, what relationship do you have with money? Is money controlling you? Or are you controlling it? Touch your neighbor and ask them that question again. Is money controlling you? Or are you controlling it? Because if you don't, if you have a wrong relationship with the material world, you are demonstrating to Satan that he has mastery over you because you worship him by your attachment to the money that gets you the things that you want to use to enhance your status. And thus, your recognition in the world system that God has already condemned. Because enmity with God is friendship with the world. And friendship with God is enmity against the world. Are you listening to me? Can I go a little bit deeper? When you take money and serve the kingdom, you are demonstrating to God that you serve, not the world, but you are serving him. You are serving the creator by using the creation to serve him and that you don't worship the creation 
because it is a perversion to worship creation rather than the creator of the creation. So in this world, money has a lot to do with everything. Touch three people and say, I'm not going to disobey God in the money issue. You spend your life working. And you're supposed to take the proceeds of that work to serve God with. Rather than use it to create an image for yourself. Because we take the money that we've worked for. We buy clothes to define who we are. Because your clothes define who you are. We buy status symbols. And some of us will go and buy huge gold chains to put around our necks. And buy some gold teeth. And then buy a flashy car. And we're demonstrating that we're now somebody. So we've used the money to create an image. And the war of these end times is which worship system are you in? The worship system that calls you to bow down to the world and create an image for yourself. Or a worship system that compels you to give all to God and then God to form your own identity by making you of no reputation. Because if we're going to be like Jesus, the first thing Jesus said is he became of what? No reputation. And he emptied himself of all his glory. So if we're going to be like Jesus, it means that in the world we must diminish our image that we're trying so desperately to build must die. We must die to the things of this world so that we can be alive to the things of God. I've got to stop. I haven't finished. I've just started. Or perhaps another time. We are in the end days. If we're really going to worship God in spirit and in truth, then it not, cannot come from here. It must come from here because we have laid down our lives and we have laid down everything that was precious to us. I'm not speaking some highfalutin thing. I'm telling you my experience with God. Because I am a man that laid down all my churches to walk away with nothing and start all over again in pain. It's your pain that forces you to worship and causes you to lie prostrate on the ground. If you haven't been through pain, then you have no power because it's your pain that God turns into his power. How are we going to change our nations? Because our commission Matthew 28, go and make disciples of nations. And that word nation, ethnos, cultures. How can we disciple cultures when we're conforming to the culture? Touch your neighbor and say, you've got to be a change agent. A transformer. Stand to your feet. Lift up your hands. Say, Heavenly Father, tonight I'm asking you for the power of the spirit of compromise to be broken off my life. Lift up your voice and begin to pray. Tell God I'm joined the line in the blood of Jesus. I will not compromise my values. I will not compromise my standards. I will not compromise my faith in God. I will not compromise the things that God has written in His Word anymore. I will try my utmost best by the grace of God to live up to the standard of His Word. Where God says no, I'm going to say no. And where God says yes, I'm going to say yes.
tell God, I want to be a, a world changer. I want to be a transformer. I want to transform my generation. You are the generation that God is looking to. And you cannot fail God because our generation has failed Him. You are the next generation. You can't fail God. God is depending on you to stand and change your world. God is depending on you to be a global force of transformation, changing values, changing moral codes of conduct, bringing sanity into a world of insanity where our children are killing themselves in their schools. You are God's last wall of defense. You are the last man standing and you've got to stand got to stand for what is right you got to stand for what is true you got to stand for what is honest you got to stand for integrity you got to stand for righteousness you got to be true worshipers who are ready to lay down everything till you get to the laying down of your life that's what worship is what you lay down for God Jesus worshipped, he laid down his life. Abraham worshipped, he laid down Isaac. What are you laying down? What are you laying down? To show God that you are really serious with the calling of God upon your life. What are you laying down to show God that you want to be a global force that God will use? What are you laying down? God is tired of songs and the heart is not engaged. What are you laying down? We have left everything to follow you what have you given up for God to show God that you mean business with him that God can trust you with the awesome power and the grace and the wisdom that you need to change your world and if you're going to change your world you've got to start with your surroundings And say God I give you my life that's cheap when God asks you for your life he's asking you for all your substance first because those are the things that are he said life does not consist of the abundance of things a man what possesses so the first thing that will go in your life if you really lay down your life are your possessions My life has changed. Because when God called me to leave all my churches and leave my nation that I was a father over, to start from scratch at my age with nothing, I never knew it involved a loss of identity because people would come and see my small church and despise me, not knowing that because they never saw me in my former glory. It's pain. And they treat you as a small boy because people tend to measure things by what they see. It's the most painful experience. And people laugh at you because I gave up a nation. It's pain. It's a lot of pain. It's a lot of humiliation. But you gotta go through because Jesus said you must to be like him, you must be of no reputation. I literally had to give up all my comfort. God is calling us out of our comfort zones to live by supernatural faith. How can you claim for, ask God for the anointing of Elijah? Then it means you're gonna have to trust God to send ravens to feed you three times a day because you have no other means of support.
when that widow gave up her last plate of food she was giving up all means of carnal material support to trust in God and that's where we are now because the world is tired of talk the world wants to see action Nobody will ever change until they see you in the fire and God bring you out of the fire. Then they know that your God is real. Then they'll say, we will follow you because we have seen our God that can deliver you after this sort. So my life has changed. And in my nation, I'm going against the popular tide. I refuse to hype people. Like I said, to motivate a fool, you become a highly motivated fool. To motivate a thief, you become a highly motivated thief. So where the church is swimming this way, I choose to swim in the opposite direction. And it attracts persecution. But that's what I'm supposed to be, an apostle. Apostle means the commander of a fleet of naval warships. We're at war. You cannot conform to the status quo anymore. You're called to break the status quo. And to bring a new standard in God. And it's painful because you shall be persecuted. But once you take your stand, sooner or later, God will show up and vindicate you. But it's time, global force, to be a global force. The world wants to see you go through stuff and come out of it. So they know that when they go through it, they too can come out of it. And they'll come out of it better with God being exalted. For this reason, I live. David put it this way. Is there not a cause? Is there not a cause? Are you willing? down your lives how does God know that you're being real by what you give up for God and those of you that want to follow God then show me what you're giving up for God because if you can't even give God your little money that God gave you in the first place if I take an offering now Watch all of you switch. Boom. These people are asking for my, my money. Who said it's your money? Is it not God's money in your hand? And if God wants it, he has a right to it. He gave it to you in the first place. But you're showing him something. What did God say to Isaac? Take thine only son, thine only, whom thou lovest and lay him down on the altar I always say to people if you can't give God your money you can't give God your life <laughs> if you can't give up the things that are precious it's easy to say I'm laying my child in the basket that's why David said bind the sacrifice to the altar so once you give it you can't pick it up again You are going to be world changers then you must lead in change and reform not talk about it live it and lead it the world will laugh at you but sooner or later they'll see God show up you go through the fires of life but you see God in the fires and you can come out of the fire and say I don't just know him, I know him because I've experienced him. I'm looking for an experience. We're all talking about God visiting us. The Bible says he's a consuming fire. Have you read Isaiah 60? He's like the lava flowing down the sides of a volcano. Anything in your life that is not good is going to be burnt up. 
and it's going to be painful. <laughs> when Abraham got to that mountain, he must have been in tears. And after Isaac, God says, now I know you fear me. So all that time, Abraham was being tested to see how much fear of God was in him, which was called worship. By what you are laying down. By what you are laying down. Your identity, your substance, who you, your image to become nobody. Because these days, it's all about an image that you want to what? Project. Everything is about image. He's trying to get down to worship image in Revelation chapter 13, the image of the beast, all that stuff. I've got to get out of here. I just came to challenge you. One of the things that God is doing now you know, on this day, the last day of Passover, on the Passover this year, God spoke to me and he said, the transference of wealth has begun in earnest. On the day of Passover, that just passed, God spoke to me and he said, the transference of wealth has begun in earnest. He's been, we've been talking about it for a long time, but because this year Passover was a blood moon, and they're going to be there are two blood moons this year, and two blood moons next year. They're mile markers, so something serious has begun, a move in the spirit of God, because the pretext of the blood moon was what He will pour out His spirit on all flesh, and the pretext of that was the vats will overflow.